How's everyone doing this morning? Good. For those that are visiting, we're so glad that you are with us today. Beautiful day that God made for us, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, for those that are visiting or are coming in the middle of our series here, we are in Daniel chapter 7, so if you would turn to your Bibles to Daniel 7, I'm going to have to bring you up to speed, though, and that's okay. We just need to do a little bit of a review. We are now entering the prophetic portion of Dan- the book of Daniel. Remember, Daniel 1 through Daniel 6 is a historical narrative, and it includes Daniel's journey to Babylon. It includes his, his rule and reign under four major pagan kings, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Darius, and Cyrus. We can see that God used Daniel in his prolific career, 70 years he served in those, in that way of a position, his area of leadership, his area of expertise that he was trained in in Babylon. We can see in Daniel 6.28, it says, so this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and reign of Cyrus the Persian. We see that Daniel's end was with King Cyrus. Scripture doesn't tell us how Daniel died. Scripture doesn't tell us where he was buried. What we learned in the past several weeks, a few applicable points that we wanted wanted you to take home with you was this. We can be people of influence. Daniel was a a person of influence, wasn't he? We see also that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also individuals who stood on truth at the point of hostility. And we learn that application in our lives that when things become hostile in our world, which we have seen what's happening in our culture, things may get hostile. We can stand on the truth of God's word. We also learned that we can trust God's sovereign plan. You can, the, the book of Daniel drips of God's sovereignty, God's hand in every aspect of this man's life. And the last thing I believe we can apply to Daniel's life is this. God God had Daniel where he wanted him. He might not understand why he was taken as a teenager to Babylon, 800 miles away from home, never to return. But he was there for purpose and reason. And we can be encouraged at that point as well. You may not like the school school your, your kids go to. You may not like the job that you have. You may not like the neighborhood in which you are a part of. But understand this, God has you there for purpose and for meaning and for influence. And we can can take that here in the book of Daniel, the first six chapters. So now we find ourselves in Daniel 7. This is the prophetic journal. 7 through 12 is prophecy. It's all future events. They call this portion of Scripture the little revelation. The book of Revelation, of course, is talking about end times. This here in these five chapters are talking about future events. Through 7 and 12, Daniel, don't want to confuse you, but what we're going to do is actually we're going to go back in time. These dreams happened in chapters 1 through 6 through Daniel's rule and reign with these four kings. And so I don't want you to be confused that his life continues, he's having these dreams. No, these dreams happened in chapters 1 through 6. Now as we begin this morning, I know that we hear the word prophecy and we're like, ugh, Old Testament. There's a lot of stuff. It's, it's like that child in school when the teacher says, we're going to learn about math today. <laughs> uh, there was three subjects I loved, recess, gym, and lunch. I would be excited about those subjects, but everything else, that was my look. Uh, history, uh, math, uh, language. But many times people come into church and they hear that and they get... Oh, no. How am I going to apply prophecy to my life? Well, brothers and sisters, prophecy is key for us as followers of Jesus. I want to prepare you this morning with the amount of information we're going to receive, the bizarre imagery that we will see. Many churches scoot past this. They bypass this portion of Daniel. Say, yeah, but it's end times, and they move on to something else. But I want us to see very importantly that God wants us to learn here from these five chapters in Daniel. You see, the Word of God, we need to learn from the whole counsel of God. All Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is God-breathed. And we can learn from every aspect of God's Word. Amen? So today, we don't want you to be confused when you leave. 
There's a lot of information, things you may not understand. We want you to, I'm going to hopefully put it out in front of us where we can process it to where we want to come back next week to learn more. I, I like lo- looking at the illustration of going to grandmother's house to eat during the holidays. I had three grandmothers. My father's parents were divorced at a young age. And so, I'll tell you, as a teenager, going to eat at three grandmothers' house was delightful. I could eat and eat. Of course, it didn't bother you because you were young and you could work it out and work it off. But after that last dinner at Grandma Tracy's house, man, I'd sit at home and be like, I'm just stuffed. I can't eat anymore. Well, sometimes we come and study the Word of God, particularly subjects like prophecy. We get so much and so much, and we sit there like this bloated individual just ate at Grandma's house for three times. And we don't want you to be that way. We want us to take it and apply it and think about it and how it applies to us in our life. So if you're a Christian here this morning, get your markers out. My Bible is marked up in Daniel chapter 7. Highlight it, circle it, because this is how we learn. If you're a visitor here, we're so glad that you're here. Um, I, as we look at the first several verses, I don't want you to think also that Daniel was taking some Babylonian drug. You see the imagery is kind of bizarre. Bear with me. What you want to take from our message this morning, this is geared towards believers in Christ of our future. As we look, if you're visiting, you're watching on Facebook, we want you to be part of this kingdom we're talking about. Okay, so as we talk about this kingdom that God is going to set here on earth for this, through his son Jesus, we want you to be part of that kingdom. And so be, pay attention to how, how to be part of this kingdom that God has for us. So let's begin. Daniel 7, look at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and a and vision of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, now this is what he sees. Watch, pay attention here. I saw on a vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. You get a picture there, what he's seeing? The sea being stirred up, and four great beasts came out of the sea, different from one another. I mean, if you're here today, you're like, man, what kind of stuff is he going to share with us today? What are these four beasts? Well, we need to go back here. Daniel is now it, it under Belshazzar's first year of reign, which brings us between Daniel 4 and Daniel 5, Okay? Visions and dreams. Remember we talked about when we were going through Nebuchadnezzar. Dreams happen when you're sleeping. Visions happened when you were awake during the times of this time of Daniel. So God was coming at him at all angles. He wanted Daniel to get this. See, we need to understand these dreams. These were, this is real for Daniel. As we'll find out by the time we get to the end of 7, this affected Daniel's health. This, is, this affected his well-being. We will hear words that he, he was anxious, that his color changed. Remember that phrase we heard and learned from ba- uh, Belshazzar, who's seen the writing on the wall? This dream affected Daniel. I don't know if you can remember a particular dream. You remember we dreamed like every 90 minutes in our sleep. But I can remember one particular dream growing up. I, dreamed, I dreamt there was a snake in my bed. Yeah, where's Frank? Yeah, Frank is probably freaking out because he hates snakes. I remember waking up like in cold sweats, jumping out of my bed and lifting my covers out off because I thought for sure that snake was in my bed. And then I went to my mom and dad's room and slept. Um, But I want us to understand that this dream was real for Daniel. What he seen was just like it was was right there and it, it, it scared him. So I want to show a a, a slide here this morning because what Daniel sees here goes back to what Nebuchadnezzar dreamed in Daniel chapter 2. We see this image, this idol. And remember, God gave Nebuchadnezzar this dream that the the four kingdoms represented this in this golden image. Well, Daniel now in 7 sees and represents these four kingdoms or kings in ferocious beasts. See, Dan, Nebuchadnezzar seen it as precious metals, the four kingdoms of the world. God gives Daniel this vision of four ferocious beasts. Now, we may, might want to ask, okay, so how do we know this is about the kingdoms, these, these beasts that are coming out? Well, i will be a spoiler alert. If we go down to Daniel chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, it tells us, the text tells us, I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. Okay, we're going to go backwards here, but the four great beasts are the four kings that rise out of the earth. So there answers the question, how do we know it means the four kingdoms that rise out of the earth? Because the text tells us this. So what we want to do this morning is this. I want to take you through this dream, 
And hopefully, and hopefully understand what Daniel was seeing. The first verse we see here in the first kingdom, verse 4, the first was like a lion, had eagle's wings, then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of the man was given to him. This is believed to represent the Babylonian kingdom, particularly King Nebuchadnezzar. You see the description there? A lion. What, what was the representation of Babylon? Lions. Winged lions. Well, the wings represent the power and the glory and the majesty. Isn't it very interesting we understand what God had Nebuchadnezzar go through? He was like a beast of the field. The wings were clipped as a picture of humility to where now the man is standing on two and he was given the mind of a man. This represents, the first beast represents the Babylonian empire. Okay, so you're with me? Here's the great sea. The great sea was there. And here comes this lion with wings. You freaked out yet? Verse 5, Babylon was the first kingdom. Second, and behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, arise, devour much flesh. This second beast, this bear with three ribs in his mouth, represented the Medo-Persian Empire. The three ribs represented three kingdoms in which King Darius and Cyrus overtook. Babylon, Egypt, and Lydda. That's what the three ribs represented. Devour much flesh. They were that power during that particular time in history. So you have the lion Babylon. You have the bear, which represents Medo-Persia. Now look at verse 6. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard with four wings of a bird and its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. I know what you're thinking, man. This guy just keeps getting worse of the beast that he sees. What do you think the, 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 this, this third beast represents? This represents the Grecian Empire. Leopards are considered a very fast animal, correct? You put four wings on a leopard, it would represent agility and speed. What do we know about history? Alexander the Great was the, one, the youngest emperor during this time, and he overtook the world in record time, unlike any other emperor of all time. So this leopard represents the Grecian empire. The four heads would represent the four generals that, king, uh, that Alexander the Great divided the kingdom up for. He didn't have any children, so he couldn't pass his kingdom down to children. So the four heads represent the four generals that the kingdom was divided into after he was gone. So the four-headed leopard is the Grecian empire. Now, verse 7, Daniel sees a beast he can't describe. He knows what a lion, yep, he knows a leopard, he knows a bear, he, he, he can see that. So you see again, we're still seeing these, these animals come out of this great sea. The fourth, here we go. The fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceeding strong, it was great, had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little horn. Now, our focus this morning is going to be on that little horn, okay? So circle that there, and we'll come back, and I'll give you some description of what that is. Before which three of the first horns were plucked up from the root, and behold, this, in this horn were what, eyes like eyes of a man and mouth speaking great things. This particular beast, undescribable to Daniel, it was freaky, it was scary, was considered the Roman Empire. And if we, if we, again, know our history at all, we looked at that, that idol that Nebuchadnezzar seen, that iron, the iron, iron legs of the Roman Empire, it was the longest kingdom. It had the, long, the longevity of almost a thousand years. And if we know anything about the Roman emperor, particularly during the, the time of Jesus, no one messed with Rome. Rome was a powerful kingdom. They knew how to crucify people. They knew how to put you in place. Their laws and the lands, they ruled the roost. One of the greatest kingdoms of all time was the Roman Empire because of their longevity. So we see here Babylonian Empire, gone, right? Medo-Persian Empire is gone. The Grecian Empire, gone. The Roman Empire is gone. Now Daniel sees all this future. 
Okay? Daniel, right now, is still under the Babylonian Empire when he is seeing this vision. So he doesn't know about the Medes and Persians yet. He doesn't know about the Grecians. He doesn't know about the Romans. God gives him his vision for the future. So what does, what does Daniel see next? Whose kingdom will last forever? Whose kingdom will last forever? Well, I like, I like seeing verses 9 through 14. I titled this God's kingdom. And so, so understand, just follow me. He sees this great sea, these four beasts coming out with represent, we believe, those four kingdoms. So now he sees this. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days, and there, that's, that's God himself, took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and a thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Now Daniel sees God himself on his throne. I love the description here that Daniel sees of God's throne. We can see that picture in Isaiah. We can see that picture in Revelation. This is the power of God. In this particular text, it's the judgment of God. Now who is he judging here? It says the books were open. The thousands that were in front of him, the thousands that were behind him, we believe to be angelic beings that are getting ready to execute God's judgment to the Antichrist, the false prophet, and the beast. This is the judgment that is coming to that fourth beast. But as we, as we get to that part of the text, it's like Daniel's missing something here. Like in his mind, he's thinking, okay, so there's the four kingdoms, and then all of a sudden, God's judging the kingdoms, the king, that one kingdom. So what, what, what caused God to judge? Well, God answers that here in verse 11. Like, what happened here? Why is there judgment all of a sudden? Verse 11, I looked and because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. Again, that horn there represents, we believe, the Antichrist with eyes and mouth. And I looked, the beast was killed and its body is destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Again, Daniel's all seeing this future. He's seeing this all ahead of us. And the things that he's seeing are things that are ahead of us. We can't see. We don't see it. Verse 13, I saw in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like the Son of Man. And who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. And he came to the Ancient of Days. His Father, God the Father, was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Daniel here is seeing Jesus, the Son of Man, given authority by the Ancient of Days to have his literal thousand-year kingdom on this world. Brothers and sisters, look at the word people, languages, tongues, or nations. Guess who that is? Guess who that is? This is us. This is us. We will rule and we will reign with Jesus here on this earth forever and ever and ever and ever. And I'll seem too excited about that. This is what Daniel sees. This is our future. Of all the horrible events that we will read of the end times, of the things that happen on the world stage, guess what we have a promise? That God will save us from the wrath to come. Look what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. He says this, For God has not de- destined us for wrath. Now, I want us to get an understanding here because we, we can kind of, there's some theological debates on, you know, we're going to go through the tribulation, all these, no, the, we're going to keep our head above the weeds this morning, okay? But I want to just give you this promise. We will not go through the wrath of the tribulation because this is God's promise. He's, we are not destined for wrath. And that wrath there is talking about the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord starts at the beginning tribulation and it ends with jesus coming to set up his kingdom and brothers and sisters you know where we are we're coming with jesus behind on white horses coming down to set up his kingdom with him that's where we are in this story here we are we are saved for salvation and we're not destined for wrath what a promise that we have from our savior okay so that's who that's what daniel sees so let's just recap here real quick Four kingdoms coming out of the sea, representing Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. 
One of those beasts, the fourth beast, has that little horn, which we believe to be the Antichrist. It's causing a little bit of havoc in the world Daniel sees. Then it shows God on his throne, executing the judgment with his angels to the false beast, the prophet and the Antichrist. And then he sees the Son of Man and his kingdom that will rule forever and ever and ever. That's a pretty cool dream. Okay, so we come to that point. Now, the rest of our text this morning, again, prophecy can be confusing, but I want us to understand Daniel now. We see Daniel is concerned. Verses 15 through 22, we see Daniel's concern. I want us to picture you're in school. I really don't want to picture them in school, but I'll pretend with you this morning. And you ever have that, the teacher that's going through that math formula, and it gets to that last portion under the, in, in the parentheses, and you understand this, you understand the second one, that third one, you're like, teacher... I need some explanation on that. Have you ever had this question? Please tell me I wasn't the only guy that was kind of dumb in school, um, particularly in math. Right, Mason? Me and you were the same age. Like math, like uh, any math teachers here? Good. <laughs> math, math's a great subject. So Daniel now is going to the angels. Okay, okay let's hear. I, I just have a. I just need some clarification on that fourth beast. Look at verse fifteen. So here's the dream. He had his dream. Now, verse 15 starts with the clarification of some of the things he's seen in his dream. Are are you with me? Does that make sense? Okay, so look at verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious. Circle that word anxious. This was affecting his well-being. He was nervous. He was worried. And the vision of my head alarmed me. He was alarmed of what he's seen. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him, with the truth concerning all this, and where we believe it's an angel. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Now, we read verse 17, 18, that the four kingdoms, the four beasts represent the four kingdoms. Look at verse 19. Then I desired to know about that fourth beast, which was different from all the other rest, exceedingly terrifying in its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, and which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped that was left with its feet. And about the ten horns were on its head, and the other horn that came up, and before them three of them fell, and the horns that had eyes and a mouth that spoke great things and seemed greater than its comparison, companions. As I looked, the horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. He's reviewing his dream, and he says, listen, I just have a question on this, this horn. What's, what's going on with this horn that's coming out of this freaky beast, that fourth beast. Well, verses 23 to 28, Daniel gets his clarification. Daniel gets his clarification. Let's read, continue reading this morning. Thus he said, as for that fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the power of the whole, trample it down, and break it into pieces. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down these three kings. Now, there's a lot in, as far as prophecy in those verses. We believe the Antichrist is going to come out of a revised Roman Empire. There's a lot involved. There's a lot of pieces. Again, we want to keep our heads, we want to keep out of the weeds this morning, just give you an overview. There's a lot of things we will talk about next week, and there's further study in this. But we want to just figure out what Daniel's seeing here as far as our future Look at verse 25. He shall speak words against the Most High. Well, we know the Antichrist will do that. We can read that in Revelation. And shall wear. um, The ESV says wear circle. Here's what wear means. This is what he will do to the saints of God. Oppress them. He will wear them out, wear them away. Like an individual, the picture of wearing a garment over and over again. That is what the Antichrist will do to the saints of God. He will oppress them the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hands for a time, times, and a half a time. See, this madman will not only blaspheme God, but he will oppress those individuals who come to faith during the tribulation period. Where will we be during this time of the time of wrath? Up in heaven. Receiving as during our, our award ceremony, we believe, the judgment seat of Christ. And we will be up there, with, we will be with Jesus, and then at, at some point when Jesus comes in Revelation 19, we will come with him to set up his kingdom. But during the tribulation period, there will be individuals who will come to faith. 
Remember the 144,000 witnesses that will be chosen by God, and they will come and they will evangelize the world. God will send two witnesses later on in the day of wrath, and those individuals will be a proclamation of the gospel. Don't you see and love God's long-suffering even during his wrath? Believers will be harassed, and, and being a Christian during the tribulation period is not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. This man, this leader, will change the way that people worship, and he will do it when? The midpoint of the tribulation. Right there describes it. Time, times, and half a time. Now, in the context, what those, those words mean, time means one year. Times means two years, so there were three. How am I doing my math? Good. Three years. And half a time is a half. So at three and a half years, the Antichrist, Daniel sees it. He will change the way he does things, and he will demand to be worshipped, and he will desecrate the temple of God. This is what that little horn does, and this is how God's judgment will come on him. Understand this. That little horn, the one with the mouth and the eyes, the Antichrist, I grew up in a fundamental church back in the 70s and 80s, and I'm going to tell you, the, 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 the rapture movies were freaky back then. They scared me to death. And they always, they always had the Antichrist as this villain. You know, right, Paul? Always as this villain. Come join me as I take over the world. Do you know the Antichrist is going to be a winner? You understand? The Antichrist, when he sets his foot on stage and he makes peace with Israel, he, you're, you're going to want to have that guy on your team. Like, he's a good-looking guy. He knows what he's doing. He's powerful. He's young. He's charismatic. You're like, man, that's the guy. But what the world doesn't know, that he will be possessed by Satan. And his whole, his whole job is to bring down and try to attack God and his people. Look at verse 28. Daniel sees, oh sorry, verse 26. So he sees this antichrist disrupting the world, but God has the final say in Daniel's dream. Look, but the court, and I want you to circle court there, the judge, almighty God, shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall take, be taken away. Meaning the antichrist's dominion will be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Who is that? That's us. That's us. His kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Look at verse 28. Here is the end of the matter. This is the end of my dream. This is what I've seen. As for me, my thoughts greatly alarmed me, and my color changed, and I kept the matter to my, to my heart. He was worried about this dream. This scared him, but he kept it all in his heart for the right time to share. That's Daniel's dream. I think there's five principles we can can take from prophecy, particularly this particular text in Daniel 7. I'm going to give you five this morning as we close. Our first principle this morning is this. God knows the future. God knows the future. See, we can have a one-year plan, we can have a three-year plan, we can have a five-year plan. But who orders our steps? The Lord does. God does. God knows the future. You know, we could be scared. We, We read this text, this is what's going to happen to the world. But you know what? We can be confident. Why? Because our sovereign God sees beginning and end. I I like the illustration of a parade. You know, for a Faith Bible Church, we participated in the violin parade during Christmas time, and we were, we were put in, in staging areas. If you remember, we parked the bus down there on Landis Avenue, and, we had st- and this person was up here, and this church was up here, and the mayor's float was way up there. And we made, well, I didn't see the parade. Why? Because I was stuck in my staging area driving you guys around, throwing candy at people. Prophecy is like the same way. Right now, we're in a certain staging area. Daniel was in another staging area, but I is like in that blimp. And he sees the whole parade from beginning to end. And he knows how it's all going to work out. And that's who we trust. That's who we belong to. That is who we will rule and reign with on the kingdom of Jesus Christ here on earth. So no, God knows the, the future. Number two, our second principle this morning is this. See, we can understand prophecy and future event, but this, the fulfillment, unfulfillment may be uncertain. 
We know it's going to happen. God's word says it's going to happen. But we don't know when it's going to happen, do we? The rapture of the church. How many years have we heard? Oh, this is it. Oh, Harry Kissinger's the Antichrist. I grew up with that one, you know? Oh, the Lord's going to come. The 88 reasons the Lord was going to come back in 1988. That book scared me to death in middle school. Because I didn't want to, honestly, I, I wanted to live my life, right? Like we all, do, we all say, Harold Camping, how many times had he said, yep, Jesus is coming October, whatever the date was, and we're all sitting there like, you have to admit, you're kind of like, is he going to come today? I know he doesn't. Is he going to come today? Right, because someone said, speculation. Who is the Antichrist? I don't care, because I won't be here. I won't be here. And we can speculate, and we waste our time. And speculation, we can speculate, man, there's some things happening in the world, man, we start looking up. But shouldn't we be looking up from the, for 2,000 years? We're living in the last days. We should be constantly looking up. But I know, we speculate, man, things are happening. Is this the end of America? Oh, very well could be. Oh, no. Uh, guess what? We don't know when things will be fulfilled because God knows the future, and we just trust and rest in that. I love what Moses said in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, but what has been revealed belongs to us and our children, that we may follow the works of the law. There are things that we will not know in this lifetime, but God does, and God is in control. And for end times, events, we know what's coming, we're waiting for the trumpet sound. But guess what? God makes that call. God knows when it's all going to happen. Thirdly, Third principle, God has a plan for kings and kingdoms. We've read that. We see four major kingdoms coming out of the sea that Daniel sees in his vision, his dream. But I want you to know he also has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. We th- read scripture, we're like, I'm just this little number according. God doesn't care for me. But we read Psalms 139, says God intricately woven you, each individual, in your mother's womb. He formed you out of substance, to be who you are. Jesus told his followers in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, listen, if I care for the birds, if I make sure they're fed, if I I take care of the lilies of the field, how much more will I care for you? God has a plan for you. We get caught up in the prophecy, yes, this is what's happening, but guess what? God cares for me. He has you where he wants you. He wants you to do his job, his will, where you're at in your position, at work, in your community, at home, he loves you. He cares for you. He has a plan for you. And guess what we just seen Daniel's vision? Guess what his plan for us, end game is? We're living in his kingdom. We're ruling and reigning in his kingdom. Be excited about that. Church, that's, that's our vacation plan. Like we look at, at, at brochures, oh, we're going to Disney, we're going to this. This is our vacation. We're going to heaven. This is what it's going to look like. This is who we're going to be with. And Daniel... Daniel prophesied it thousands of years ago. It's exciting. Principle four. When we see prophecy fulfilled, it should give us confidence. At Christmas time, we were talking about the coming of, uh, of the incarnation of Christ. There's 500, about 75 prophecies that talk about the coming Jesus, coming Messiah to the world. When Jesus came, when he lived, he died, was buried, and he rose again, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies in Scripture. There's like 25, 26 divinical writings of other faiths. Muslim, Hindu, Sikhs, Confucius, those, those beliefs. There's two things that they're missing. One, a living founder. I just spoke with mine this morning, so we're good, right? Amen. Jesus lives in my heart, lives in my life. So we're good there. We have a risen Savior. And two, fulfill prophecy. You will not find a living founder or fulfill prophecy in any other of the divinical books. But here we do. We can be confident in God's word because of what has come true and what will come true as we continue on this journey with him. Lastly, and I can't take credit for this particular point. I heard this. I said, that's perfect from another pastor. I heard this, so I'm going to use it this morning. It says this. And point five, preparation, as we think about prophecy. Be prepared for the Jesus of the second coming by trusting the Jesus of the first coming. 
Be prepared for the Jesus of the second coming by trusting the Jesus of the first coming. Skip Isaac, pastor of Calvary Chapel of, of, uh, of New, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, he says this about this particular point. We think about Jesus of the first coming. And for those that are visiting, or maybe, or maybe, uh, maybe it's a little confusion, it's not talking talk about two Jesus. He just came, comes in two different positions. Here's what Skip Isaac says. When Jesus came to earth the first time, he came as a servant. When he comes the second, he will come as sovereign king. The first time he came, he came in obedience. Philippians chapter 2. The second time, he will come as commander. The first time Jesus came, he lived with a poor Jewish couple in Bethlehem. The second time, he will come with the angels of heaven to rule the entire earth. The first time Jesus came, he came in humility. The second time he will come in the majesty and glory on a cloud wearing a crown. See, Jesus came the first time, his incarnation as being born of a virgin to the uh, life of Mary and Joseph. He was the Savior of the world. He came to die. His his job was to come, to be humbled, to die on the cross for for the sins of humanity. Exactly. Paul tells the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why Jesus came this first time, to die for the sins of humanity. See, salvation is a gift, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It is a gift, and it's there to receive. Jesus did the work. He paid for our sins. He took upon the very wrath of God, so we would not have to endure that in hell. And he says, hey, accept this gift. It is free for you. Accept it. See, Daniel 7 shows us God's plan for humanity from beginning to end. But it also shows us that God's people will live in a kingdom that will have no end. And Jesus will rule and reign that kingdom. As I said at the start of our message, for those that are visiting and maybe are watching and maybe are just questioning faith or maybe you're, you're new to the faith, understand this. We want you to be in that kingdom that will have no end. And there's only one way to be part of that kingdom. And that's putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Accepting that Jesus of the first coming. Trusting him so you're ready for him and his second coming. It's very simple. There's always the people say you have to say a certain prayer. You pour your heart out to God. Say, God, save me, forgive me. Come into my life, change me. I want to live for you. Thank you for dying for my sins. Give your heart and life to Jesus this morning. And get this kingdom that Daniel seen. We're going to be side by side living in that kingdom. But you must give your heart and life to him. You might not understand everything about the Bible. Hey, it's a daily process. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, it is the best decision you will ever make in your life. It will change you. It won't keep you from struggle and trial, but it will give you someone to rest on through the struggles and trials. It's going to give you freedom from sin. Will we still sin? Yes, but we have someone who paid the price for our sin, so we will not receive the wrath that was for that sin. Will you trust him today? Call upon Jesus to be your Savior. It will change your life. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you have done for us. All heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And as Judy will just kind of just play a little bit of uh, music here this morning, it's just I want you to think about something this morning. For Christians that are here, this should be a, a, a text of hope. That this is our future. We know there's a lot of things that are going to happen and we're going to be in heaven and God's going to take care of the things here in the future. But we know what our end game is. It's to be with Jesus forever and ever, living in peace with Him. And for those that are watching via Facebook, those that are visiting, that are just, uh, maybe just questioning, just have a lot of questions, we're, we're here to answer them for you. We want to walk you through this journey and answer those questions for you. You don't need to be at church to trust Jesus into your life. You could go home and think about this. You could be in your car. You could be out in the yard. And you're here today. You're watching today because God's Spirit is moving in your heart. Will you listen to His call?
Will you call out his name? God, save me. Forgive me. Come into my life. Change me. I want to follow you. If you make that decision, whether it's here or after church or this week, please let us know. We want to we help you take your next steps in your journey as your walk, in your walk with Christ as you learn more about this great God who we serve. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Pray that you work in hearts and lives. In your precious name, amen. Stand up and let's sing the first verse in the chorus. You are here moving in our midst.